Hello, welcome to Innovative Thinking, Building, Dreaming, and Loosening the Space in Between. I'm Greg Holderfield, Director of the Seal Design Institute. On behalf, on all, on, and on behalf of all of us at Seagull and our co-host, the Farley Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Gary Zamchuk. Gary is an innovative strategist who has worked in technology environments such as AT&T Labs and IBM, and in world-class design studios such as Rockwell Group, ESI Design, and Pushpin Studios. Gary is an adjunct professor in computer science at Columbia University and has served as strategic designer in residence at Cornell Tech. He illustrated the best-selling French for Cats humor book series, designed innovative labs for Coca-Cola, scoped out the experience for a Disney World parade, and, in, and is a co-founder of Words Eye, a technology startup building a first-of-its-kind application that lets anyone conjure 3D scenes by simply describing them. He is also currently co-authoring a graphic novel entitled Making Change Really Happen for Penguin Random House. Welcome, Gary. Before I turn the mic over to Gary, I want to let the audience know that Gary will be answering questions at the end of our talk today at around 1240 Central Time. So please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A chat section of your screen. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn over the mic and the stage to Gary, who will, be to, and who will start today's conversation. Welcome, Gary. Hi, Greg. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greg and Hayes for having me today. Um, I wanted to start with a couple of comments. Um, when I first spoke to Dean Otino, I was excited to learn that his early experience as a painter informed his understanding of, of the science of liquids, which has been the body of his work uh, for his lifetime. And so I've taken the importance of that early experience and the idea of liquidity as inspiration for my talk today. So with that, I wanna launch this um, deck that I have and uh, we can start talking about inventive thinking. Let me go here, boom. Okay, so um, I hope you all can see that. I'm excited. So Stranger Things has its upside down, but I wanna talk about the in-between and that's the space between building and dreaming. And it's also the space where you get to big ideas. So I have this graphic in the middle, which represents kind of a, a thinker with a big idea. And that itself is a big idea, which I'll talk about more, but it's from Word's Eye and it's using language to create a scene of this kind with 3D graphics. So the two conditions I imposed on myself were to be relevant to Siegel and Farley students Siegel with its uh, emphasis on design and entrepreneurship and Farley uh, entrepreneurship and technology, and also talk about something that I know. Now, after a year of quarantine, I'm not gonna talk about dogs, but I am gonna talk about what I've learned in the kinds of environments that I've found myself in. So let me close this little uh, window here. Okay. so. Um, I've kind of had a knack for working in and out of design, technology, and business environments. I started in companies like Pushpin and animation studios like the Ink Tank, and then went into technology environments, as, as Greg mentioned, AT&T Labs Research, IBM, Sarnoff. Uh, I then went back into media companies like Time and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and then over into doing a lot of product and service development with Fortune 500 companies like Amex, Marriott, J&J, Wells Fargo, Coca-Cola. Um, and then another dip back into experience design. And I kept taking a step back further and further from drawing to creating experiences in real places. So an innovation lab for Coca-Cola, sketches for a hotel for Nobu and things of that nature. Um, how come this isn't advancing? Okay, so um, that's all right. Okay, so if you plotted my career path, you'd see something like this. Um, 
it's kind of gone all over the place. And, and I had to wonder why that was happening to me. And I think you'll get a sense of that over the course of this talk. But at the core of it has been inventive thinking. That's what's allowed me to kind of seamlessly integrate into all these environments and mix it up and most importantly, collaborate with all these teams. And there's been countless people in these environments. So I'm excited about sharing my thoughts around that. Uh, I wanna move this out of the way. Okay. So in a time of, of disruption and rapid change because of AI, because of COVID-19, with the climate changing, you know, we're caught up in all this movement and either we're gonna go nuts as some people have, or we're gonna learn how to be very comfortable in an environment, this I call it the between building and dreaming, where you are, where inventive thinking happens. And in order to maintain our footing and our bearing, I think it's really important that we uh, hold on to things that we own. So I'm gonna talk about early defining moments that make us who we are. As I mentioned with uh, Dino Tino and his painting, informing what he became, and what we do. And I'm gonna talk of that in, in terms of the passion mapping. And then I'm gonna carry that a little further into the book I'm working with on with Tony O'Driscoll and talk about how organizations have to change to manage uh, major forms of disruption. Okay, so when I have a class at Columbia, I teach Creative Application Studio, the class comes in and I have little or no idea of who they are or what they are about. So I start by asking them questions. And the first question I ask is how many of them are builders? And a lot of hands go up because they are computer scientists uh, for the most part. And then I ask them how many of them are dreamers and every hand goes up. Everybody has an idea or a vision that they want to make an impact with. So I'm very excited about that because my class focuses on that space in between. It's a liquid region. And this comes back to the liquidity idea. Um, and, and that liquid region is very important because you can be building things, you can have these visions, but you have to stay loose in that middle region so that you can come up with new, new things, get new combinations. And so my hope for the class is that they'll work through exercises that loosens up the middle, but as importantly, informs them as to what that, that their modes of discovery are. Okay, so the first thing I ask them to sketch up and share are these early defining moment drawings. I think of them as little petri dishes of authenticity. And I get this amazing array on day one and they share it out and there's a lot of excitement about people describing when they were you know, four years old or five and they're out in the backyard using a magnifying glass and burning holes in leaves and maybe killing a few ants as well. And I love the things that they learn from that experience. And that becomes an anchor for them going forward. Some people talk about getting lost and loving maps because it once could have saved them from that experience or building or psychology or really str uh, strategically planning where they're going. And I love the idea that we're using drawings to do this because drawings have a way of bringing us back to those early moments when we started to draw and most of us forget to, and that's a beginner's mind moment. And so uh, authentic connection, beginner's mind is what I'm hoping for there. And as you see, some real things and real orientations come out of this and I, as I'm doing my class exercises, I invariably go back to these drawings, A, to remember who all these students are, and B, to say, is what they're doing in my class aligned with what they're excited about? And it's a very simple process, but I wanna describe why this became so important to me. Um, when I was in a junior year of college, I was really uncertain about where what I was going not because I didn't have anything that I was excited about. I had a lot of things. And I thought a career aptitude test might point the way for me to know where I'm going. So I said, you know, I can't wait for the result of this test because I'm gonna finally know what's most exciting to me and here's where I'm off to. The result that came back wasn't what I expected. I think I might've broken the, uh, the platform 
And not only that, but it said that my goals were completely unrealistic and probably I should just hang it up. Um, so I was very unhappy and my body was unhappy. I started getting panic attacks and I even got a bat, bout of appendicitis. So I had a little time, a couple of weeks to think about, so why am I in this situation where I'm excited about so many things, but there doesn't seem to be an answer to where I go. So I thought back to when I was around four years old and my parents, my dad was a teacher and he took us to Hawaii for the summer. And I wandered off away from my two siblings, older siblings, I've obscured them here with my, my tadpole pond image, not purposely, but it's kind of apropos because it was a moment of liberation and freedom for me. And so I found a, a white styrofoam cup and I dipped it into a pond uh, just near Waikiki Beach. And I pulled up what looked like tadpoles, little squiggly beasts with bellies and uh, plumpness and little babies. And some of them had little arms sticking out. And I was blown away. I mean, not only was the water warm and verdant and the light streaming through it, but it was an entirely immersive experience. And I was sitting on the edge of it, but not only that, I owned it by holding it in my hand. And I think that was a very important thing for me. So it took me a really long time to understand that that powerful moment was something I was gonna look for, for a long time. And that it was kind of an undifferentiated wow experience. It's like, yeah, I wanna do everything. I'm curious about a lot. And it turns out it had scientific, behavioral, humorous, theatrical, aesthetic, uh, and mostly it was this wonder and immersion. So I, that set me on a course, and I think it sets a lot of my students on a course. It was kind of an aha, ha, ha, ah, and ha moment. I call it ha, it's kind of the new one, because it was a beginner's mind moment. I had no clue what was going on in that water, but I was excited about whatever it was. So in the context of that moment, all the things I wanted to do made perfect sense. So that's where I got my sense of things from. And as a consultant now, you know, you have to start to map where you're going and understand why you're doing things because you don't know what's next. And I understood what I was excited about. And then around 15 years old, I started getting a sense of what I deeply care about. And that was people. And I would do these drawings about my brother first in his crazy adolescence and then move on to this is your life drawings for everybody in the community I lived in. And I would charge money, so I was making money. And I said, oh my God, I'm an artist, I can draw. Um, and so I've, I've used this passion map and all my students work through this map as well and, uh, and so forth, it goes on from there. So just blowing this out a little farther, what I learned was that curiosity that I had is not a monolithic concept. Curiosity can be broken into these pieces. In my case, I just happen to be excited across a lot of them. And if I follow any one of those vectors, you know, I start seeing that, yeah, I did go to college for a biology degree. And that kind of stemmed from this tadpole thing. And then I did go to AT&T labs and work in research and work with researchers on medical stuff at Cornell Tech, work on robotics, and now ultimately at a novel technology company. Um, so I, I, I found that track really exciting. And then I had this other track was, which was about museum design and aesthetics, a spectacle on Governor's Island, um, innovation labs for Coca-Cola or parade design for Disney. So all these things branched off. Humor is almost predictable because I could use funny drawings to do funny things. My French for cat books over here. And then finally, this category of ha, huh, and beginner's mind, and what am I gonna do? You know, uh, what I don't understand and doing the most with what I don't understand. And that's what that path is about. So after a few weeks, I start to get a very good sense of who's in the room with me and how, who they are as inventive thinkers. And I also get a sense of their path and uh, where they're going. Uh, mine might've started at A and gone to B, but some of them have other kinds of paths even sketchier than mine. 
And what I love most is that the drawings they do in class have a huge impact on the applications they develop or scope out. So someone who has a lot of anxiety and social things and they draw about it and they express their fear might do an application about predicting how uh, neighborhoods will change over time. Someone who embedded themselves in nature and loved grasshoppers might work out a mobile housing scenario with eco-friendly and self-sustaining. So as opposed to a brute force method of coming up with ideas for applications, this is a passion-driven method for getting to those same ideas. I wanna talk a little bit about inventive thinking when, and you know, I'm starting with this because it's a fun story. I tend to get really lucid at four in the morning. And so I'd wake up and I would try to write ideas down. And it's usually something I was wandering around during the day trying to figure out and boom, there's an answer. And then I read that uh, Thomas Edison would also, he would sit in an armchair and hold pebbles in his hand and he'd fall asleep. And when he did, the pebbles would fall out of his hand, land in a pan and startle him awake. And he would write down ideas. So that was his method. And I thought it was kind of a colorful thing that my wife bought me this pen, which had a light nib at the top. And that way I wouldn't just write things all over each other. I would actually be able to space them out and make them legible in the morning. So that was really good. So inventive thinking and how. Um, I think all of us, but not just scientists. I know these are multidisciplinary programs, uh, Farley and Siegel, but Artists, writers, architects, business people, we all wander around with problems on our minds. And, and what happens is new ideas are discovered at the intersections of planes of thought. Um, Arthur Kessler, in my mind, is the person who's written about this with, in the most exciting way, but he described this behavior as bisociation, the perceiving of a situation or idea in two self-consistent but usually you don't see them together, habitually incompatible frames of reference. So, you know, if I'm any one of you, I think can project yourself into this scenario where you're wandering around trying to solve something and you just do not have the answer. And along, you, you let it sit for a while, you take a shower and then other thoughts start to intrude. And actually the problem that the answer that existed outside of that plane of thought actually comes into bearing because you have another thought that brings you to it. So this is a, a real argument for collaboration with others where people are throwing out ideas and it almost doesn't matter who's in the room, anybody can have a good idea. And the excitement is that you can now hit those things that may be outside your thought plane. So you can look at this in terms of humorous discovery uh, where ideas collide in a fun, surprising, and unexpected way. I love Roz, um, but here she's merged two new age ideas, eating uh, tofu and, and uh, a, a futon, which was a very big thing in new age world. Um, here's civil protest and dis dictatorship. The person doing this poster said, oh my gosh, I can create a clown out of, out of Stalin. And this one, my cartooning teacher at uh, school, uh, Parsons School of Design, Mort did this thing where, are you sure this is fire? And obviously he had the two things in mind around invention, but he felt like that got across the idea. So aesthetic discovery is something else. And I learned a lot about this working at Rockwell Group and other places like that. And this is where you have uh, sensory imagery uh, verbal, visual, sensory imagery colliding in a meaningful way. So when they're designing the dream hotel, you have someone thinking, well, it'd be nice to have the canopy look like a theta wave so that even before you get into that experience, you're in it. Um, down here, it was a sketch I did for Rockwell Group where we were thinking about what's the nature of um, uh, pools at Nobu Hotels, which was a brand new concept. And in this case, I had a, a, a clear miso soup and a, and a miso soup, clear soup and miso soup. And I tried to use them to inform the ideas around the pool area. This idea around a giant shed, cultural shed, shed center in New York City is phenomenal. This shed has a sliding door 
which opens up and allows a huge audience to also be covered during you know, inclement weather and so forth. So these are aesthetic dis interactions, uh, like a bridge over troubled water. You know, I don't know what was inside Paul Simon's mind, but you can see where he brought two things together, sounds of silence. He's actually very amazing at that. Scientific discovery is probably the most popular one we all know about. And often these things happen by accident. Um, Eureka is the most famous moment when Archimedes discovered that you could uh, use water displacement to find out the density of gold. Um, this fellow who was trucking through the uh, Scottish uh, countryside discovered that cockleburrs might provide a way of fastening that never existed before. Um, the Fleming, I think, discovered that mold inhibited certain forms of bacteria and discovered penicillin. There's people who discovered that these, um, these termite mounds actually aerate naturally, and maybe that could be used to um, aerate a building that's under construction. And then I've put word's eye here because it was the intersection of scientific domains. Sometimes it's the entire domain that comes together natural language processing and 3D graphics so that you can use a simple sentence and generate a picture of a, uh, a stool pigeon. Okay, so what I love about this and what excites me, uh, maybe because I'm a generalist, but it's the spectrum of discovery. It's that ha ha and aha ha and ah and even ha, huh, you know, all are on a continuum. And that you can, as an inventive person, you can have a mind that remains in a constant state of discovery across all these types. Um, so it's really kind of fun to think that a caricature to a humorist might be considered a schematic to a scientist, might be a stylization to a poet. And again, this is Arthur Kessler's observations, and I think it's brilliant. Um, or a riddle to a humorist could be a problem to a scientist and a, an allusion to a poet. So that kind of thing really excites me. I'll talk about ha huh in a moment. So I wanted to just show you one intersection. So I wandered into Bob Coyne's office at uh, AT&T Labs Research, and Bob had a picture of a shark floating above a rowboat. And I said, how'd you do that? And he said, oh, I used language to do that. And I was blown away. I'd been an illustrator, cartoonist, and I had never imagined that in language words, the big flamingo is a foot to the left of the silver cube, could actually be parsed into a semantic representation and then go through processing that would arrange those objects in a 3D scene. And it was just mind blowing. And frankly, I've never left that room since I met Bob. And I've been working with WordSci now for a lot of years. So I'm really excited about it. And I just wanted to give you a sense of where it's going as a tool so make the same scene in two simple sentences is a technology goal. Right now we have this kind of language that can describe where these objects are in relative to one another and it creates the scene. But we could, over time, we will be able to say the man is behind the long marble table in a darkened room, a feast is on the table. So you can imagine how it democratizes uh, 3D graphics. And then, you know, you can also move back to the end user goal here and enable a new form of creative visual expression. So we had a challenge that let people put down ideas around COVID and we had uh, all our artists on the platform, wordsi.com. Uh, this one generated a scene of a man uh, from inside the COVID molecule. Here's another one out on the street Here's uh, fear at the beauty parlor. So she's getting her hair done, but all of us were terrified to be exposed to other people. And what's great about WordsEye and why this is a new creative visual expression form is because people can riff on each other's graphics by just changing a word or two. So we've enabled that and I'm very excited where this is happening, but that's the in-between language and image that this uh, technology offered. I had mentioned we'd come back to Ha huh? and Beginner's Mind. I had the good fortune of working at Cornell Tech and they had a uh, digital life initiative where they had speakers come in to talk about AI and ethics. 
and all these great folks came in, Tim Nick Gebru, uh, uh, Douglas Rushkoff, uh, Moran Tamimini. And this actually was a perfect thing for me to be doing. And I didn't really know exactly why, but it's because it brings together my love of people and the importance they have. It's also me sitting on the edge of a tadpole pond again and dipping my cup in and seeing what it is and not really fully understanding it. And so again, the value is what can I do with what I don't understand rather than what I do. These people really understand it. Um, so I just wanted to give you a, a sense of what those kinds of things look like. So getting to um, my most recent effort, I'm working with Tony O'Driscoll at, uh, he's from Duke University, he's a phenomenal organizational strategist. He looks at how companies change. Um, and uh, we got together and pitched this book to a major publisher. And so it's due to come out in January 22. And what it is, is a hero's journey of a middle manager named May B, maybe. Um, and maybe works in the middle of a very hierarchical organization, and she has all those inherent structures of leadership. And uh, being in the middle, she has a unique understanding of what's going on in operations. She understands what leadership is telling her, and she sees where there's a disconnect or a need for connection that may not be there. And so when the world is subject to a dramatic event, and we called it a field undulating disturbance, it falls upon May as a middle manager to save humanity. And um, I know most of the people I'm talking to at Farley and um, Siegel are entrepreneurs. So in some ways you're already on your respective paths and, um, and not necessarily heading into this position, but I think it's true that inventive thinking is what is going to, uh, needs to be unleashed in order to address changes even at the organizational level. So we have, um, we of course have May trying to do what the, we call the muckety mucks want her to do, you know, impose hierarchy, demand performance, dictate the direction, maintain control, all the things companies currently do and she realizes uh, through intervent divine intervention that she actually has to instill a different mindset. And that's why I think mindset is so important. And I know Siegel and Farley both have a real emphasis on a creative mindset. So um, I think that instilling the idea that you can catalyze a network and let people envision possibilities channel aspirations and their own and give agency also comes back to passion maps. It comes back to inventive thinking and that's what's going to enable a company to change. It also means there's gonna be these epic confrontations between the old and the new. And um, so that happens in our book and perhaps the collapse of hierarchical structure and a leveling um, I think we've seen a lot of that in corporate world, but we also still have a lot of that in corporate world. And what form that takes is really important. So um, in terms of leaps of imagination, I call them, this isn't really the emphasis of the book, but to me, you get to a place where the, there's limits to incremental change that you can uh, bring about based on production methods that a company has. There are limits to what machine learning can do to learn those things, train AI to do it and produce, in this case, a device that will uh, protect each individual on the planet, it's called a FIG, from the FUD, from the field undulating disturbance. So to get past those limits, there actually has to be a leap in thinking. And in order for you to have the wherewithal to have leaps, you have to be in that liquid space in the middle. And so it could be that there's a guy there um, who's a trickster, who's a jokester, who loves playing with humor. And um, they may be the type of person that get that idea. It may be a newbie in the company 
that just pops up out of the back of a meeting and says, you know, this is really what you need to do. Uh, I've done this before. So here's, here's someone who's learning from another industry, say the toy industry, and saying, I have a solution that can actually mediate this problem. And then, of course, the goal is to save the world and deliver one of these things to every person on the planet. Um, so I hope uh, that's an exciting idea to you. I think it's really important right now to be thinking about how companies change, especially how much uh, disruption has sped up. And, um, you know, so that's what I wanted to communicate there. So just to summarize, and I'm going actually faster than I thought. I thought I'd be like, oh, I can't believe I'm not going to finish all this. But I will say, to summarize, you know, connecting authentically, and I'm going to put this in the frame of the students that I'm talking to, you know, uh, most of you have chosen an idea or pursuing an idea or using design thinking to come up with a new idea. And I hope that you remember that the core of it should be something that lets you one day stand in front of an investor and be the one who should bring that thing into the world. That I think is critically important. And I think that comes from back when you were four or five or six. Some people have this later for cultural reasons where, you know, they didn't have the playtime. So maybe the playtime starts later down the road. But those moments that stayed with you all that time, connect with them, ask yourself what they are. And so that you know that you're in line with that. And then understand these modes of discovery I was mentioning. You know, what excites you? Is it, you know, aesthetics? Is it scientific? Is it humorous? If it's humorous as well as one of the others, that's all the better because when you're meeting with a team, you want funny ideas to pop out. You want aesthetic ideas to pop out. Um, those things actually are uh, oil to a process that makes the process work fantastically. So um, getting in touch with those will let you find out where your new, new things are. Loosen up your thinking. Uh, this is, again, the shower thing, but it's also bringing people in the room and, and believing that everybody has something valuable to offer. And it may just jar your thinking. Uh, a lot of the, the ideas have to here have to do with, um, what's the idea? That basically these things can be washing your hands in the sink and you realize the soap is breaking down something and maybe that's what I need to solve this other problem. So sometimes it comes out of these little things that don't have any relevance to what you're working on and you have to be sensitive to them. And that just means you're living in that kind of liquid region in your mind and are waiting to see those things. And then make leaps and uh, don't worry about bringing things in that you learn. Almost everything you learn can be brought into play. So if you learned it in the toy industry, put it to work in whatever you're doing in the medical industry. And then you'll have to confront older thinking. And that's a lot easier to do when you completely believe in what you're doing. And then of course, you have a chance to save the world, uh, which is exciting to do. Um, I added this slide just to show that the simple change of the word from the large goal, uh, the large polka dot egg can turn this scene into a humongous gold egg. And that's kind of what we're all after. And um, so I hope that uh, this can inspire you to some degree to pursue those things that you're most excited about. So I'm finishing about five minutes earlier than I anticipated. And, uh, not a problem. We are we are entrepreneurs and innovators. We're happy to innovate and pivot. Um, thank you so much, uh, Gary. I appreciate that. Um, we do have some questions, if that's okay. And I don't think anybody will oppose uh, uh, in this age of Zoom fatigue, uh, wrapping up a little earlier. So that's absolutely. It's always good okay. to be efficient. But thank let's you. try to let's. I would like to get to these questions, uh, if if that's okay. Uh, if, uh, if you can answer those, that would be much appreciated. Um, one of the questions is, how can artists and scientists collaborate effectively? In your experience, are there challenges inherent to this kind of collaboration across disciplines? I, I don't think there are challenges. I think that it's actually, scientists are very creative. They, they are 
people who have an idea and they're exploring it and testing it. Uh, I've, I've worked, it's a great question because I've worked almost my entire life with scientists. And the, the, the thing I've always felt very valuable in that environment. And I think artists in general are extremely valuable to scientists. I think that surprise in all the ways that I was talking about it is what a scientist might need to get reoriented to a new way of thinking or a new thing to test. So I don't see any conflict. I just hope more companies embrace uh, creative people in that context. At at and Labs Research, I, was, I named myself Principal Non-Technical Staff Cartoonist. Everybody else was a principal technical staff member. And that was because I was always coming orthogonally to the thinking that they were doing about their applications. So I thought that was a valuable contribution I was making. And the other point I would make is there were often brainstorming sessions where someone would lead it off in that type of technical environment and people who are builders will build and build and build. And so the changes are very incremental. And so I, we actually served pop rocks in one of those meetings <laughs> because it made us kind of go, maybe this could be something different this time, maybe. And you know, I would probably come out of the blue with things um, I thought they were all valuable. It didn't always divert the course of the session, but you know, it was a, a chance to do something. Terrific, thank you. And I love Pop Rocks, by the way. I haven't heard of those and haven't had any in a while. I might have to go out <laughs> looking for Pop Rocks. Right. Um, from from, from uh, Professor David Gatchel, we have a question. Uh, Professor Gatchel says, I had a prospective student recently ask me how we teach creativity with Siegel. I responded that we do not teach creativity within Siegel, but give students opportunities to discover and practice their creativity. How would you have responded? I totally agree. I don't think you teach creativity. I've kind of given a bit of a framework about what you have to be alert to when you're being creative, meaning don't stifle yourself and stay in a single plane of thought and drill down but allow lots of things to bloom in your mind. The greatest brainstorming session I ever sat in on was French for Cats, all right? We were creating a little book. It was a humor book. It sold 350,000 copies. So it was, it was a good idea. And French for Cats, all the French your cat will ever need. It had no market, but the person writing it was Henry Beard and he's a genius. And he was the co-founder of National Lampoon and a Harvard Lampoon editor. And I sat in that room and the, it was as though every window was open on all sides of that room and the wind was blowing through and ideas were just being thrown out, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll get back to individual creativity, but the idea that you let it all come out and not inhibit yourself is what's important. And Henry had this incredible ability to hold on to it all. He didn't record it. He just held on to the important bits and synthesized them into this really clever book. And so I, I think that um, enabling your students um, to be who they are and understand what makes them excited is where their, their creativity lies. And I certainly am an advocate that everybody has it and maybe it's sitting compressed, but it just needs to be released and, uh, and it's our job to help them release it. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, you speak of working on many projects at once. How do you determine which project to work on at a time or how to focus on your one project to finish the project or pivot to the next? How, how do you manage all this? This comes down to a little bit of hormones, I think. It's like, I have a lot of dopamine and I probably have a lot of estrogen, right? So the dopamine makes me react very strongly to things I'm excited about. So on any given day, you know, if I have three projects, then I'm gonna go for the thing I'm excited about at the moment and boom, you know, I'm delivering. Luckily, I have serotonin, you know, <laughs> as well, which lets me plot out and work through what's required to deliver on things. So 
it's again, um, it's a balance. It's a almost a chemical balance on what I choose. And um, it's very, uh, so, so to me, what it has to be about is that you have to be excited about what you're working on to deliver on it. It, it can't just be wrote. I did spend a year, you know, working for Avaya doing slideshows. That may be the only time in my career and I recognize that I'm a little different because I, I made a, a duty out of pursuing what I was excited about. But, um, you know, there your serotonin kicks in and you deliver a job and it's important. But I'd like to think that people can also use as their guidance the things that they're excited about and they've known for a long time and that's where they're going. And I think these students in particular in a, in a program that's entrepreneurial they are pursuing those things. Um, another question, we have uh, quite a few questions from the audience and, and uh, I'll try to, I have one myself, but I'll, I'll hold off on that. For, oh uh, so um, how can we, this is from an audience member, how can we be more confident about the vi viability of our dreams in the real world? The vi competent, I, you know, dreams are great. Uh, creative thinking is great but ultimately everything gets tested. You know, it gets tested by budgets, companies decide what they go forward with and don't go forward with. So my feeling is that you push for the most extraordinary things, knowing that they're gonna be contained. And you don't, you know, you can't get disappointed with containment. You can see it as one step towards a vision. And hopefully that vision will then find uh, currency with others. And one thing I'll say about drawing, and I'm a great advocate of drawing, obviously, but when you put a drawing down on the table, it has the power to galvanize a team. And they see a little sketch and it could galvanize them in the wrong way. If, if Lamarck shows, you know, that a giraffe's neck gets longer and longer to get fruit, you know, over two generations, it could make people believe Lamarckian theory. Right, so a drawing is a very powerful thing that can mislead. But I think that it's important to, um, to push for ideas that are strong and persevere like anything else. Okay, we have a mix of, of faculty, staff and students, of course, as you know, uh, we ultimately are here to uh, educate students and many of them are, are, are early in their, in their journeys. And to that end, we have a question that is, what advice can you give for practicing tapping into the beginner's mind when you feel stuck creatively? How can we continue to be inventive and curious during times of stress such as the pandemic? Of course, that doesn't apply necessarily just to students, but, but yeah, how, how can we, I mean, it's such a great opportunity. It's such a great time for innovation, but there's a lot of stress during the pandemic. So, so how do you power through? You know, it's as I, I, I imagine a lot of the stress comes from worry about what careers are going to be engaged after I get through this process. You know, if I'm talking to somebody as a grad student, they're really concerned about the next thing they're doing. If you're an undergrad, you might still be getting your orientation on where you want to head. And uh, you might have a little bit of a picture like the one I presented earlier, where you have lots of things you're excited about and you can't figure it out. And I don't want you to get panic attacks or appendicitis. So I completely understand the concern. And all I can say is um, it, it's getting in touch with what it is that you find exciting in yourself. I can't say that enough. And um, moving towards it somehow, you know, a startup, a lot of a startup is done on paper before you even make a single presentation to an investor. It's got a you know business model canvas. It's got um, you know plans drawn out, diagrams. There's so much you can do by throwing yourself towards something that um, that you can. You have to find the the incentive to do that. Um, I keep in mind that luck is where opportunity uh, preparation meets opportunity. So that's a good definition of luck. And I find that if you are preparing for something and you may not even know what it is, it may turn into an opportunity um, 
and make you a very lucky person at a certain point. And that's happened for me time and again, just because I would sit down and just work up something and say, this is cool. And then, oh my God, it actually prepared me to do something I didn't know I, I would. You know, I, I know several people are doing things right now. My son comes to mind who's been doing these video podcasts. Um, they're streaming on Twitch. And I'm saying to myself, wow, look what he's doing. But I don't know if he's preparing himself to give TED Talks or whether he's preparing himself to uh, um, just to be a, an academic. I don't know, but it's it's fascinating. And, it, and we're going to find out. So I'd say just find it and, and do it. Uh, starting, let me say, the last thing is, the biggest thing is starting. Too many people consider like, oh, what am I going to do? And don't get started. The whole dynamic shifts the second you get started. So I'd say, jot something down. And then all of a sudden, you're in a whole other place. That's what moves you forward. So it's about getting started. And uh, I've always had a very low start threshold because I'm, I don't, I'm not worried about being an idiot. <laughs> you know, so that, that's a biggie. I know a lot more people very close to here that have a harder time and they get stuck. So, so uh, failing is okay. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> we, and, we, I, we, and I think kids are learning that kids, students, mm -hmm. older you know, who are playing games. I think you learn that obstacles are obstacles and you're gonna find your way around them. Um, so I think there could be a lot to learn from game playing. Yeah. What, one, I, I, one last question that I, I'd like to ask. I mean, you've had this really interesting career and as you illustrated so beautifully, it has not been linear. I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty right. squiggly here, there. And, and so, you know, to the students who, who are on, on the call, who sort of understand the path to becoming a product manager or to being a chief financial officer. That, that's not that anything ever sort of goes according to plan, but you can at least plan for that. How do you plan to do the cool stuff that uh, Gary Zamchik has been able to do? And specifically, you know, if you could touch on some of your work for Coca-Cola or Disneyland, I think that would be interesting. Yeah, it's, um, again, it's dopamine. It's what am I excited about doing? And when, you know, asking yourself, where am I going next? And I would do these little diagrams. They don't look like my current passion maps, but it would be a little diagram. Where, I am, where am I with cartooning? Where am I with um, uh, experience stuff? You know, and every time I did something, I added it as a new track. And I said, these are little tracks that could continue. And I just didn't want any of those tracks to stop. And, and now I've realized that they are pretty divergent you know, um, you know, going to uh, doing product development work for Coca-Cola or something for uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, you know, helping uh, describe the capabilities of, a, of an intel agency or um, a humor book. These things are pretty widely divergent. Um, and so you could say that I just responded to what I thought was interesting. It comes down to people. And I've always talked about there's two types of people. One are your mentors, the people who you said, oh my God, I'd do anything to be like them and what they're doing. And I pursued very strongly to work as close to those people as possible. So I tried to find those people doing what I love and could I work with them in any capacity? And I did that, that's one thing. But then there's the people who actually help you, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, that. They, they recognize that you're excited about things. And that comes back to early defining moments. What, if you can walk in and show them that you're excited, they want to help you mm. and they want to open the door for you. And I can't be more grateful to the helpers as a generalist than I am to the, the modelers, the people who modeled what I was after. So pay very close, to, like if you're showing your best self and you're going after something you're excited about, other people are gonna be excited about it too. And I think you wanna um, go towards those things that you love.